Okay, so in this lecture, I just want to give you a brief overview of some of the highlights of evolution. Okay, so feel free to stop the video and look more closely at some of the illustrations, um, but I just want to point out some of the major points. So you've already learned about Darwin's voyage of discovery. So you learned about the voyage of the Beagle and sort of the view of the times. Uh, the two main parts of Darwin's work that we want to focus on is that he explained how modern organisms evolved over millions of years and that modern organisms came from shared or common ancestors. So those are like the two main points. Okay, and here's just showing his Voyage of the Beagle. So over 10 here, that's where the Galapagos is. That's probably his most famous stop along the way. All right, so what did Darwin, um, what observations did he make as he was on this voyage? So there are three main things that he used to develop his theory. The first was that he noticed that species varied around the world. So places around the world that had similar habitats often had different animals that were ecologically similar. So animals in very different parts of the world, clearly not related to each other, but yet looked similar because they lived in similar habitats. He also noticed that species varied locally. So this is a good example of what he saw in the Galapagos Islands. So the Galapagos Islands are very close to each other, but each island is slightly different in habitat. Some are drier, some are rockier, and so various species on each island, even though they're very closely related, they look different or have different adaptations because of that particular island. So the two sort of most famous examples are the finches that have different beaks depending on which island, and there are different tortoises on each island. All right, and then the third thing was he noticed that species vary over time. So when he looked at fossils, he saw that fossils were similar to living species, but they weren't exactly the same. So things had changed, um, but he could clearly see that there was a relationship between them. All right, and here's just showing the different um, birds that are found on these Galapagos Islands. Notice the bills, so the beaks are very different on each bird. And that's because the main food on each island is slightly different. So depending on the particular habitat that bird um, is a part of and what food source, its evolved beak looks different. And so even though these are all closely related birds, they look very different from each other. Okay, here's an example, kind of the opposite. These are birds in very different parts of the world. So the ostrich is in Africa, emu is in Australia, rhea is in South America. So they're not closely related, but they all look pretty similar because they've evolved in similar um, habitats. And so the same types of adaptations are useful for all three of them. All right, so what are the main points of natural selection? Okay, so when we think about natural selection, we have to put together these four points. In nature, organisms produce more offspring than can survive. In any population, individuals have variation. So if it's mice, it might be fur color. Um, in other animals, it might be how fast they are. But there's variations in, among multiple traits. Individuals with certain useful variations survive in their environment, passing those variations to the next generation. So sometimes you might have heard this called, um, you know, survival of the fittest. So those organisms that ha are most suited to their environment are going to survive and pass on that particular trait. And then over time, the offspring with those variations that are useful are going to make up most of the population and may look entirely different from their ancestors. So that's the whole idea of evolution by natural selection. And so three things to keep in mind is natural selection is discussing traits that help an organism survive are more likely to get passed on to offspring. Populations evolve, not individuals, all right? So um, an individual doesn't adapt um, in this sense to the environment, but a population does. Um, and natural selection only works on heritable traits, so traits that can be passed on by genetics. All right, the other um, theory besides natural selection that Darwin um, really is known for is common descent with modification. 
So Darwin proposed that organisms descended from common ancestors, and this goes along with the idea that organisms chain with, change with time, eventually becoming so different that they form new species. And this is called cause the evolution of species and really sort of the history of all living things. So all species living and extinct are descended from ancient common ancestors. All right, so let's look at some more specific lines of evidence. And I'm just gonna highlight a few here. There's tons of evidence for evolution. So that's why we call it the theory of evolution, because this is really um, what the vast majority of scientists believe. So we talked a little bit about in the fall about um, body structure and embryos. So remember, homologous structures are structures that are shared by related species that have been inherited from a common ancestor, whereas analogous structures might look the same, but they don't suggest common ancestry. Vestigial structures are inherited structures that have lost much of their original function, and so it can show that evolutionary relationship. And then if you look at embryos, uh, for instance, many types of vertebrates, they're going to look similar in early stages. And so that leads evidence. All right, so here's some example of homologous limb bones. So here would be our ancestor, and you can identify these color-coded bo color bones. And the same bones exist in all these different organisms. Even here's a wing and a foot. So you can identify them, but they have evolved to form a specific function. So they evolutionarily um, are similar to this, and so we can deduce that they evolved from this, even though they've changed along the way. Here are some examples of vestigial structures. So I'll point out here's a whale. So whales do not have hind limbs, but they have small um, vestigial uh, bones that form the pelvis and femur, so they don't really have a use for this anymore, but it indicates that they probably descended from animals that actually had limbs and were using these particular bones. So they've just gotten small enough now that they're not useful anymore, so they're vestigial. All right, the age of the earth and fossils. So much of our evidence for evolution comes from fossil finds, so piecing together um, how a species evolved over time, what layers they're found in, we can indicate the age so we can um, figure out how that's occurred. And more and more as we looked for fossils, we found transitions. So this is um, a diagram showing the strata. That's a fancy word for layers. Um, so different layers can be um, dated. So the older layers are generally the deeper. And so we can see which layers a particular organism is found in. Here's an example of a fossil echinoderm. So the fossils we can see are related to organisms that live now, but are not exactly the same. Okay, and here's some example of horse evolution. So again, you can see earlier horses that were smaller, and for instance, their leg bones were slightly different but you can piece together how it evolved from one to the other until you get to modern day horses. Here's an example of whale. So again, here's our whale with no limbs, and here's where we think of the ancient ancestor. And we've actually found enough transition skeletons that we can really piece together a very good story of how this evolution occurred. All right. In um, more recent years, genetics and molecular biology have played a huge role in how we think about evolution. So remember, we have a common genetic code, which is shown over here. Um, we also have homologous molecules. So these are molecules that descended from the same ancestor protein, let's say. So this is showing proteins that are very similar, right? We also know that different organisms have the same proteins. And by looking at how many differences in the DNA, we can piece together how closely related organisms are based on these DNA differences. So that's a very strong piece for evolution. All right, we can also look at artificial selection. So these are changes we've made by choosing um, different characteristics that are valuable to us. You probably know this from looking at different breeds of dogs, dogs, 
or domesticated animals like cows. They don't look anything like their relatives in the wild. Um, but we selected the characteristics um, that we want. And then you can see how much difference can be made over just a few generations. And this is showing pigeons. So this is what Darwin actually studied um, because there were a lot of people that used to breed pigeons. So he used this to help him um, come up with this theory of natural selection where the environment does the selecting. All right, so testing natural selection. So what are some real life examples and how do we think this happens? So I'm gonna go over, we talked a little bit about our Galapagos finches. So their beaks evolved on each island and in different parts of each island, depending on what their food source was. So bigger beaks maybe for bigger seeds that needed to be crushed. All right, the peppered moth is a really classic story. So here's the peppered moth. And there's variation in the population where you have these light colored ones and these darker colored ones. Originally in England where these lived, the barks of trees were pretty light colored. So most of the population was the lighter colored, but there'd be a few darker colored ones, but not so many because these got picked off pretty easily because you can see them. And if we can see them, birds could see them. So they got eaten. Right? But then during the Industrial Revolution, England burned a lot of coal, the trees turned darker. All of a sudden now the selection pressure changed. Now the dark ones have an advantage because they're going to be camouflaged. The light ones get eaten, so the population shifted to more black ones. All right, A similar thing happened to rock pocket mouse, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and then I'll talk about um, antibiotic resistance. All right, so here's our mice. So notice, here's our location. They both are light color background. The variation in the population is such that most are light in color, but there's a few dark ones. Again, an owl probably is gonna like these darker colored ones, can spot them much more easily. So it keeps the population in this ratio. But notice what happens at location B. So a volcano erupts, lava coats this area, it turns dark. So at first, it looks pretty similar. You got lots of light ones, a few dark ones. The owls are picking these guys off, though. So which ones are going to reproduce more? The dark colored ones. So as the dark colored ones reproduce more and the light colored ones less, over time, the population shifts till all of a sudden, look, it's the reverse of what it started. You have mostly dark colored ones with just a few. So you still have those genes in the population, but the ones who are reproducing the most are going to be these dark colored ones that pass those genes on. All right, does that make sense? All right, here's an example. So you've all heard of probably antibiotic resistance. So the idea is here you have bacteria. And remember, an adaptation already exists. So it's because there's variation in the population. So just through chance, out of maybe a billion bacteria, one of them can resist that antibiotic. So you hit it with the antibiotic, all of them die except these two. These two now reproduce, and bacteria can reproduce pretty quickly. And before you know it, you have a whole population that doesn't care if you take that antibiotic. It's still going to make you sick. All right. Similar thing can happen when you think about pesticides and bugs. So a whole population of bugs, most will be killed by the pesticide. But there's a few that just through chance have some genetic variation that means they can live. And if they live, they can reproduce. And if they reproduce, they pass that particular gene on. And over um, generations, eventually the population is going to be made up of these that are resistant to that pesticide. OK, so natural selection is one of the main ways that evolution has occurred. But I just want to point out there's a couple of other mechanisms um, that you should just kind of have in the back of your head. So sometimes chance plays a role. Um, a volcano erupts and wipes out one part of a population. And so the population changes just through chance, right? Sexual selection, like a peacock, is organisms choose mates for very specific reasons that might not be due to natural selection, all right? Um, the DNA can change and mutate, again, just by chance. And maybe that chance is then acted on by natural selection. There can be gene flow as animals move in and out of populations. All right, but then that natural selection is going to act on all of these to basically say which ones survive and reproduce the most. 